um, I think it's helpful to first talk about sustainability versus uh, social responsibility. When I was contacted by the uh, LEAD school, they talked about social responsibility as the topic. And we tend to see ourselves as a, a sustainable business role model. And so the term that we use for ourselves is sustainable business. So that's what I, when I say that, you'll know that I'm talking about the same thing as social responsibility. And for us, that's the three Ps. Am I standing in your way over here? Can everyone see? Uh, people, planet, and profits, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with as the triple bottom line. Um, but really, to be so, so these are things that we are very focused on. Um, but to be a sustainable business, you need to kind of make sure that each one of these works to the benefit of the other. It's it's one thing to say I'm going to be, you know, funneling profits into either our community or into my coworkers or into some um, NGO project or other or environmental thing, but that's going to be at the expense of something else because then you've got this scarcity of resources mentality. And for us, I mean, they're not always actually working in fabulous lockstep, but for us, each one of those benefits the other, which is what creates that, you know, greater whole that um, is a word that, that typically I don't like to use because it's so overused, which is synergistic. So, um, but we think that that's, and in those three pieces of, um, of business sustainability practice are pretty much wrapped up in this. And I'll explain to you how we got to this um, actually many years ago. We're not in a green industry. We don't sell a green product. But still, um, this has been uh, pretty central to who we are. Um, we, my then husband, Jeff Liebisch, and I started New Belgium Brewing Company in the basement of our house in 1991. And before we ever made a barrel of beer, we took a hike in Rocky Mountain National Park, um, and we sat down to talk about what we wanted this baby company that we were starting to incubate to be. Um, there were four things that were going to be important to us. To produce world-class beers, to promote beer culture, to be environmental stewards, and to have fun. Um, that turned out to be incredibly seminal to how we operate now. The fact that the fact that we had already, you know, had a had a, a compelling vision in our minds of what kind of company this would be. Um, we took that seriously. We've always referred to it, and um, you know, we've. I'll, I'll fill in this story with more detail as I go along. But just the fact that we knew that there were some things that we had committed ourselves to made um, a large difference in all of the things that we've done since that time. And and I really believe that it's been fundamental to our success. Um, in late, so we started in the basement of our house. In late 1992, we moved to this location. Can you guys see very well? Is it kind of washed out up there? Um, which was our second location. So at this point, we're 14 months old as a company, and we've moved into our second location. We had the Great American Beer Festival on Thursday, Friday, Saturday. I had our second child on when, the following Wednesday. And we moved into this location the following Monday. And I brought that little guy to work with me, and he came until he could walk. And then I had to find someplace else to put him. Um, <laughs> you'll notice in that slide before this, there was nothing about customers, and there was nothing about our coworkers. And that's because we didn't have customers or coworkers at that point. And it hadn't really even occurred to us that we probably ought to factor them into the equation. So that came along later. We, um, this was really the start for us of what we call high involvement culture. Um, we quickly realized that if we were ever going to be able to take a vacation, the same vacation together, that we were going to need to be able to involve our coworkers in the business of running the business. So 
that just kind of, I'm a social worker by training, and it's just that kind of collaborative energy and, um, you know, the sense that all people want to feel like they are involved in something bigger than the thing that they're doing for a paycheck just kind of is in my DNA. And so um, we began the process of involving them in how things went. And it was really also very pragmatic. As I said, we needed for them to be able to, make, to be making decisions as we went along. Um, about a year or so later, that was late 92. So in 94, um, I had kind of a serendipitous experience where I um, picked up one of those quarterly paperback book club things. I never do stuff like that. And on there were a whole bunch of different books. And one of them was The Great Game of Business by Jack Stack. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Jack Stack or that book. Um, Jack Stack is considered the father of the open book management movement. And um, he did that in a very unsexy business called Springfield Remanufacturing, where they remanufactured diesel motors and springs for heavy equipment and trucks. Um, but the premise of that is that people do want to be involved in something bigger. And if you um, show them how the company runs, and if you open up the books, and if you train them, excuse me, in financial literacy, um, they will really harness that, that knowledge and do great things with it. I was nervous about that because, um, you know, that's kind of one of the um, perhaps birthrights, if you will, of an entrepreneur is the books are mine and nobody's going to look at them. Um, so I decided to, uh, have, to do a little experiment. I, uh, we, every year from the very first year that we were in existence, we had um, a retreat with our ha first year. It was Jeff, me, and our one co-worker. The second year it was Jeff, me, and our five co-workers. Or actually, by the second year, we had about probably 12 co-workers. So by this point, we had 40-ish uh, co-workers. And I gave them a quiz at the retreat. I said, you know, it's very simple. Um, we took in $100, and we spent some of it on raw materials. We spent some of it on labor. And we spent some of it on, you know, just the other things, overhead, the other things that are involved in running a business. How much money did we have left after that? I probably should have known because Jeff bought a BMW M3 in about that same time period that things would be skewed. They said that we took $60 of that $100 home. For those of you who are conversant in the world of business, you would kill for a bit. Pet rocks, maybe pet rocks made $60 out of $100. But that's a very unusual thing to do. And in a manufacturing business, you're taking, I mean, we are a capital intensive business. I have, you know, probably, I feel like a significant investor in semi-precious metals because we have miles and miles and miles of stainless steel at New Belgium now than we had, you know, kilometers and feet and not much more than that. But um, so I knew at that moment when they said that we took home $60 out of that $100, that I might as well tell them what really happened in the business. Because the real story was more interesting and also less glamorous. And um, I was, that was really where I went running off the edge of the cliff with my coworkers as business partners.